All right. It is such a pleasure to be here at the World Science Festival. This week is, uh, for scientists, is just uh, so much fun. So we're going to start uh, today with a question, which is, how do you observe something you can't see? And this is a key question if you want to find and study uh, black holes, because black holes are objects whose pull of gravity is so intense that nothing can escape them, not even light. So we can't see them directly. Uh, the story I would like to share with you uh, this morning or this afternoon uh, is how we've been able to find a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this has provided us with the best evidence to date that these exotic objects truly do exist. Uh, which gives us a wonderful laboratory for understanding the physics of these objects, how they warp space-time, and the astrophysics of these objects, what role they play in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Okay, so to begin with, we all have to agree on what a black hole is, so it seemed very appropriate to uh, put up a blank slide. <laughs> uh, so. While black holes require relatively exotic uh, and complex physics to describe, the way I, I would like you to think about a black hole um, is the way I actually think about a black hole on an everyday basis. So a black hole is mass, is an object with mass, but this mass is confined to an infinitesimally small volume. So if we think about density, which is mass divided by volume, the density goes to infinity. And in physics, any time we have the number infinity, that's known as an in, uh, singularity, which is like a big red arrow that says, you do not have your description of the physical uh, world right here. And of course, in uh, physics, that means that we don't actually know how to make the world of general relativity, which is the study of um, gravity in its most extreme form. And black holes definitely have a lot of gravity. Um, work with the study of quantum mechanics, which is a study of things that are very small. Of course, black holes are infinitesimally small, so they qualify. So when we figure out how to um, make these two aspects of physics work together, we will understand what a black hole actually is. But today, we don't. But fortunately for me, there is a size that we can associate with the black hole. So it's a virtual size. It's not a surface of the, of the black hole, because the black hole has um, no finite size. And this is known as the Schwarzschild radius. It's popularized by um, Star Trek as the event horizon. It's the point of no return. So light, the last point that light can escape from the gravitational field of the black hole is this event horizon, or Schwarzschild radius. Um, it's also important because every object of a given mass has a Schwarzschild radius associated with it. And it simply depends on the mass. And why is this radius important? It's important because if you can figure out how to squeeze that mass down to its Schwarzschild radius, gravity will overcome all other known forces, and the object will collapse to the infinitesimally small object. So if you want to prove that there is a black hole out there in the universe, that these objects really do exist, your job is to show that there is a mass inside a very small volume, and the volume that's set by this Schwarzschild radius. And it depends only on mass. So the more massive the object is, um, uh, the larger the scale, the scale is, or the size is. So if we were to take the Earth and squeeze it down to the size of a sugar cube, it would be forced to become a black hole. If we were to scale up and consider the sun, and squeeze it on down. And of course, I had to put UCLA in there, because that's where I'm from. But take any college campus, pretty much, uh, and the sun would become a black hole. OK, so now we have what is a black hole, and how do you prove that these things exist? So now let's talk about um, where black holes appear. And the black holes that I'm fascinated by are the supermassive black holes. And I'll get back to what that means. Uh, but in astrophysics, there are two classes of, super, of black holes. Uh, the ordinary black holes, as if there could be such a thing as an ordinary black hole. Um, and these were uh, thought of uh, from theoretical studies first. 
So theorists who uh, were contemplating how stars, the most massive stars in our galaxy, would go through, uh, uh, would evolve throughout their lives, understood that at the end of their life, the inner parts of the star would collapse to form a black hole. The outer parts would explode and expand in an explosive way and form a supernova. So that's what we're actually seeing here. This is a supernova remnant. So it's the outer layers of a very massive star, a star that started its life off with roughly 30 times the mass of the sun, um, ending its life uh, in this explosive way. And um, the thinking was it would form a black hole of roughly 10 times the mass of the sun. So thought of from a theoretical perspective, and then observations have come along to prove that these objects truly do exist. Um, and that's been known for a long time. And LIGO, the gravitational wave detector, put the evidence for the stellar mass black hole in a whole other regime. So we're, uh, uh, that is the final point on the stellar mass black holes. Now, the story about supermassive black holes um, is very different. Um, the story of supermassive black holes um, come from the study of galaxies. So galaxies, there are a lot of galaxies, actually, if we look at the next one. Um, this is a picture from Hubble Space Telescope. And everything in this picture is a galaxy, except one object in the middle, which is a star in our own galaxy. Um, and the scale here is, uh, you can understand, is different because each galaxy has roughly um, 100 billion stars. In the last picture, we were looking at a single star within our own galaxy. Um, and what we're looking at is a picture at optical wavelengths, which is what your eye detects, and you see the light from the stars, the stars that are like our sun. And there's nothing um, unusual about um, this, this picture to lead us to conclude that there, was a super, there are supermassive black holes. But roughly 10% of all galaxies, if you look at them in radio wavelengths, long wavelengths, where your cell phone works, roughly, um, you see something truly um, uh, spectacular. Uh, at the center of the galaxy, the starlight is now no longer visible, and you see uh, a mission coming out, these jets, and the jets are moving tremendously fast. So they're, you know that there's something powerful at the center, at the heart of these galaxies. And at the heart, we also see a dot in the middle, and that dot has a mission or light characteristics that look nothing like starlight. And it was thought or uh, uh, speculated when these objects were discovered that what we're seeing here is the dining habits of really massive black holes. <laughs> so matter is falling onto this black hole and powering these jets. So you can think of these as uh, black holes, which are roughly a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, so much more massive than the stellar mass black holes, um, that are having a Thanksgiving feast. You know, they're, they're definitely indulging. And we see the light of the feast, because remember, you can't see light inside um, the event horizon. Okay, now those are could call them uh, maybe the prima donnas of the extragalactic world. They're kind of show-offs. They're only a small fraction. But it did lead to the question roughly uh, 40 years ago, do all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes at their centers? Um, and if we uh, are going to entertain that notion, then our galaxy is certainly the best place to look because it's the closest center of a galaxy that we'll ever have to study. So this is a picture of, a, of one of those galaxies that would uh, presumably look pretty much what, like what our own galaxy would look like if we could get outside it and look back at it. Galaxies, for the most part, are flattened disk-like structures. In our own galaxy, we have these beautiful spiral arms. But of course, we're not looking at it from the outside. We're looking from it from the inside. And from an inside vantage, our solar system is about halfway out in the galaxy. So if we look in the night sky, what we're seeing in terms of this flattened disk-like structure is we're seeing the plane of the galaxy. So this is a, a picture of the Milky Way uh, seen from Hawaii. Um, and you see the, um, the light, uh, the, the, and in fact, this is why it was called the Milky Way. The Greeks, uh, the word galaxy comes from gala, which is Milky Way. So we see a, a path that looks kind of milky from all the starlight. Um, but we also might notice that in, the, uh, in this milky band um, that there's a lack of light. 
And that lack of light comes from dust in the plane of our, our galaxy. I'm from Los Angeles. I have a very good feeling for um, what dust in the air does to you. It's like smog. So our galaxy is kind of smoggy. And um, what you know from uh, visiting a smoggy city is that if you look with your eye, your eye can't see very far through uh, the smog. So in Los Angeles, you don't see the local mountains very clearly on a, on a, on a smoggy day. Uh, so in the center of our galaxy, there's light coming out. And only uh, roughly one out of every 10 billion light packets, or photons, makes it to us. So that's why the center of the galaxy is not observable at wavelengths that your eye detects. Now, if we go to the infrared, um, which is just longward of where your eye de uh, detects light, or where your TV remote control works, you get one out of every 10 photons uh, coming to you. So you can actually see the center of the galaxy. So a key aspect of the work that I'm sharing with you today is the advancements that have been made in infrared technology, your ability to see this kind of light. Now, if I want to show that there's a black hole at the center of the galaxy, uh, the key way to do this, or a direct way to do this, is to look for the stars that are as close to the center of the galaxy uh, as possible, and to watch or measure how these stars orbit around the center. This is tracing or seeing the black hole through the, gra uh, the gravitational influence on the stars in the very same way that we could actually measure the mass of the sun by measuring how the planets go around the sun. So what I need to measure is how long it takes that star to go around, and I need to measure the size of the orbit. That gives me the mass, so that's number one. And once I know the mass, I know the Schwarzschild radius. And, uh, and each orbit gives me a size as well. So I have a mass and a size uh, by approaching the problem this way. Now, what does this mean? This means that I'm inward bound. What I want is to see the stars that are as close to the center as possible so that I can uh, confine the mass to a smaller region as possible. 